Our scripture passage today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 1 to 12. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had come to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. When they had went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the five thousands? And how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousands? And how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I am not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Growing up in a Jewish culture, Jewish, Jewish boys knew the routine. They learned of God from a very young age. They heard the stories of Moses and the Israelite people at their mother's knee. Then, when they were old enough, usually about the age of four or five, they were sent on to the synagogue to be taught by the rabbis. Now, a rabbi or a teacher was only at the synagogue in order to teach, nothing else. He performed no other priestly duties except teaching. Now, during these school years, the children, mostly boys, were taught the Torah. The Torah is the teachings of Moses, as recorded in the first five books of our current Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the extent of the Torah. They learned not only the scriptures, but also the laws of Moses. And they would not only learn these books and learn how to interpret them, but they would actually memorize them. Can you imagine memorizing the first five books of the Bible, word for word, by the time you were age 12? Now, once these children reached the age of 12, most of them were finished with school and would then return home in order to learn a trade. But a few of the very best and brightest students would continue on with their schooling. They would, in fact, get permission to study under a rabbi. And not only would they study with this rabbi, but they would actually follow him wherever he went in order to learn everything that they could. In fact, students were often identified by the rabbi who they had studied under and who they had followed. And these students were much like the disciples of Jesus' day. that They would eat and sleep with the rabbi. And if the rabbi went somewhere, the student followed closely behind. In many cases, the student would follow the rabbi or the teacher so closely that they would become caked in the dust that was being kicked up by the rabbi as he walked from one place to another. And when these students chose to follow a rabbi, they were considered to be yoked to that rabbi for the extent of their learning, which was usually completed about the age of 18. And then that student would be considered able to go out and teach others uh, themselves what they had learned. Now, when we think of these students being yoked to their rabbi, teacher, 
We are often reminded of the image of Jesus speaking in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, don't we? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, Jesus is inviting us to follow him so closely as to be covered with his dust, if that were possible. He wants us to be yoked to him and learn all we can, just as these students did with their rabbi. You see, Jesus himself was even often referred to as a rabbi or a teacher by the disciples who he taught and who were in essence yoked to him. Now these same disciples would one day be on their own to teach others the things that they had seen and learned from their rabbi, Jesus. But Jesus' teaching was just a little bit different from the teaching of the other rabbis. You see, Jesus went around the countryside of Judea and Galilee, not only speaking about the law and about God, but he also spoke about love. And this was because he truly loved others and he felt compassion for the sick and the hurt and the lost. And he traveled around healing many of the sick and crippled as well as teaching the listeners about God and the kingdom of God that was close at hand. This kind of teaching in those days was not normally seen, especially with the religious leaders known as the Pharisees. In fact, the name Pharisee means separate one in Hebrew. These men, Pharisees, were separate from others because of their strict observance of the law as it referred to ritual purity. You see, they loved rituals, prayer rituals, hand-washing rituals. It didn't matter. They just loved going through these long, drawn-out rituals so the people could look at them and see how pure they were by following all of these rituals set forth in the law of Moses. Some were even not in the law, but the Pharisees felt that they needed to be added, and so they did those, and they would always accuse others of not doing them, although in secret, most of the time, they didn't do them but they just used it as something extra to get people. You see, they were fond of praying these long, drawn-out prayers, and they would walk around town with these prayer boxes on their sleeves to look like they were very prayerful and pious. And they were frequently invited to all these events and special uh, things that went on around the town. And they were usually expected to be given the seat of honor at such events. So we see the Pharisees were what most people would call all show and no stuff. These Pharisees were frequently seen throughout the Bible opposing Jesus' teaching. They would spend their days exalting themselves, even as they denounced all the others as sinners. They would even proclaim their own self-righteousness while looking down on others with contempt. Throughout much of the scriptures, the Pharisees were described as evil and were even referred to as a brood of vipers as well as the spawn of the devil. Let's listen to the story that Jesus told his disciples from Matthew. uh, Chapter 13, it's verses 24 to 30 and then 36 to 43. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy has done this, he replied, and the servants replied, you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat that is with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. 
Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house and his disciples They came to him and said, explain this parable of the weeds in the field. And Jesus said, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will pull the weeds out of his kingdom. Everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And whoever has ears, let them hear. Now here, in many of the commentaries that I read, it appears that this passage is possibly talking about Pharisees uh, being described as the tares or the wheat, or weeds, I'm sorry, that uh, were being planted by the enemy in and around the wheat. And so it is that it is possibly the Pharisees uh, in this story who are being thrown in the fire when the harvest is done at the end of the age as well as other sinners. Never do we see Jesus attempting to bring the Pharisees to repentance. Never do we see Jesus trying to minister to them, although there were a few such as Nicodemus who came to believe in Jesus. Now instead, we see today that Jesus is warning the disciples to stay away from the Pharisees and to not become like them. And in our passage today, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have once again came to Jesus to test him. And they asked Jesus for some sort of sign in the sky to prove that he is really the Messiah. And Jesus, however, tells them that there will be no further signs given. He has done all the miracles that he will do. And if they are not believers by now, they never will be. Jesus even tells them that instead, that they are, t as they are considered such intelligent men, that they should be able to read the signs in the sky regarding the weather and such, and yet still they won't believe that he is the Messiah. Instead, Jesus tells them that the only sign they will see is the miracle of Jonah. Now hopefully we all remember the children's Sunday school story of Jonah and the whale. Jonah who was swallowed up by a large fish for three days before, in, before being spewed back out. And so it will be when Jesus is swallowed up by death and in the grave for three days before again coming back to life. And that's what he's talking about in that passage you see, Jesus is upset that these men should be so very re religious and who claim to be very educated, and here they are not able to discern the truth of the scriptures and who he is. And he's exasperated by the blindness of these Pharisees. So Jesus just takes his disciples and he leaves. And Jesus then warns the disciples of the yeast of the Pharisees. And of course, as we know, the disciples they did not understand what Jesus was talking about. They assumed that Jesus is talking about regular bread, which they have not brought with them. Can you imagine how exasperated Jesus is? He's saying, why would I be talking about regular bread? Didn't you just witness the miracles that I performed with bread? Didn't you just witness how I changed and multiplied all this bread to feed the thousands? Jesus finally gets through to them that they are to watch out being like the Pharisees and their false teachings. Like yeast, it doesn't take much false teaching, often just one word to change people's thinking and to get them off on the wrong track. Multiple places throughout the Bible speak about false teachers and false preaching. Sadly, it is very prevalent today and only bound to get worse. But listen what we are told in 1 John 4, 1 to 6. It says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, 
because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. You see, we are to test everything against God's word. We can't believe things just because it sounds good or just because it makes us feel good or because it makes our church or ourselves look good. You know, there are so many feel-good churches out there with pastors who will never tell you that you are doing anything wrong, that you are on the wrong path, or even that hell is a very real place. People don't want to hear the truth that we are all sinners and we are all condemned to die because of our sin, and it is only through the mercy and grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that has changed that. We are to pay attention to what is being said, to weigh everything we hear against what Jesus has taught and what the Bible says. We can't change or try to interpret the Bible to say what we want it to say. Many people and many pastors, unfortunately, do that. When we think of yeast, we think of it being a very fine powder. But when activated with water and mixed with flour and sugar, the yeast starts to infiltrate every part of the dough, and it causes it to rise and grow larger and larger. And so it is the same with false teaching. False teaching is like the yeast. It comes out of someone's mouth, and it can seem very insignificant. But the more it is heard and the more people focus on it, it starts to grow and spread until it has infiltrated every part of the person who has listened to it. You see, we as disciples of Jesus have to be aware of the same problem yet today. We are sadly surrounded by false doctrine, false teaching, false churches. I had a friend of mine tell me that her son had started going to a, a Barney church. You remember the kids when they were young, the purple dinosaur, I love you, you love me, you know, we're all one big family. That's all they taught, you know. Pastors are tending to sugarcoat sin to keep people in their pews. People don't want to hear messages about sin and death. They cringe at the thought of Jesus' blood and crucifixion, and they don't want to be told that they are doing anything wrong. Instead, people come to church to hear about love. You know, they want to hear the pastor say, Jesus loves you. I love you. All we need is love. Spring flowers, sunshine, rainbows, all good, right? All pretty. Then we shake hands and go home. We feel great right? Never a message on salvation, the blood of Christ, the sin or the cross. Yes, we need love. Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, I love you. But we tend to sugarcoat our sins and the sins of the world to make it less offensive, while all the while the devil is carrying the sugar and the yeast and sprinkling it everywhere like fairy dust. We need to open our eyes and see that sin is sin and hell is real and it is the blood of Christ that is the only thing that saves. We have to recognize the cross and the crucifixion and that the day of judgment will be real. 
We need to read our Bible so we know right from wrong and we need to walk as close to our rabbi Jesus Christ so that we are covered by his dust and yoked to his side. We need to stay close enough to recognize the false teaching that is all around us lest we end up walking the wrong road and aren't able to recognize it. For Matthew 7, 13 tells us, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many, many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. We have to remain diligent and on our guard for the yeast of the Pharisees the false teachers, the contempt for all things that pertain to Christ will only become greater. So we need to stay closer to Jesus now more than ever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to show us the way, to tell us the truth and to be the light that dispels the darkness that covers this world. The darkness that threatens to overshadow us with its lies and its deceit. Protect our hearts and our minds from false teaching. Help us to discern right from wrong, truth from lies, and to believe only the truths that are found in your word. Empower us to seek you above all else and to follow Jesus so closely that we may be covered in his dust and yoked to him not only now, but for eternity. Amen.